Um, in the beginning of the book, you said, every time we rescue, hover, or otherwise save our children from a challenge, we send a very clear message that we believe they are incompetent, incapable, and unworthy of our trust. So for parents who might fit into this category, how can they drop that and start yeah. trusting <laughs> their Because we never mean to do that, right? We would... Uh, you know, every and the the story I tell in in the book is that you know just when I was sort of peak upset with the students, the parents of my students, I realized that my nine year old child did not how know how to tie his shoes, um, and was yeah. so humiliated by that that he didn't tell me, he didn't tell his teachers, he didn't tell anyone, um, and he was you know having to sit out classes. He was considering not doing this um, this. Uh, they were going to do an outing to go ice skating and there are lots of laces on ice skates yeah. and I realized that he was thinking about not going to that because he like that's a lot of laces so I was horrified because I did that I, that's learned helplessness and I did that to him mm -hmm. so the way and how I did that to him was every single time he went to go tie his shoes I'm like oh I'll just do it it'll be faster or just let me do that right and so what he was hearing was oh no 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 you can't do that let me do it so I always try to think about when I step in, is it from a place of giving them some productive information that will guide them toward figuring it out themselves? Or is this just me taking over? Because if it's me taking over, then what I'm telling them is, look, just let the big grown up that you will never be as competent as mm -hmm. just do this for you. Because they're never going to get an opportunity to be that competent. And I also have, you know, I have, uh, we have a joke that when my kids, when my oldest kid was really, really little, when he was a toddler, he would used to say, let me self it, let me self it, which means let me do it myself. Oh, right. And so in, in my head, I still hear that let me self it, you know, sort of as a mantra in my head when I see my kids struggling with something. And often, you know, with adolescents, I think it's really important to remind parents that adolescents don't always want us to fix their problems. Sometimes they just want to hear, have someone listen to them. And yeah. I don't need to, like, we feel, and I, especially as an educator, feel this incredible need to fix the problem, give an answer, fix the problem. You know, parents come to me all the time with their questions about parenting, and I always feel bad, like I can't wave a magic wand and just fix it for them. But what I can do is I can give someone the tools to work on that in their own life and figure it out for themselves. That's the best I can hope to do. And that's the best we can hope to do for our children because yeah. we need them to get to a place where they can self it. <laughs> so if I can't rescue, if I can't hover and I notice my child is struggling, so, mm -hmm. um, you know, forgetting homework, forgetting to come right. to projects, right. forgetting to study, and right. they are failing the grade. Mm -hmm. So every single yep. subject they're failing, yep. what do I then do? Yeah. Because the typical thing of a parent would be, okay, I need yeah. to come in and I need to fix yeah. this and yeah. get you on track. So what do you recommend? There's, so, because there's actually, I, think, I think a lot of parents are probably going through this now because... Mm -hmm especially with the yeah. and you know students group. oh I'm hearing from lots of them absolutely right yeah so with with that in mind with the stresses that we're all experiencing now and parents are seeing their, their children struggle mm -hmm. through this pandemic and they're failing but you can't rescue and you can't hover what do you do then so there's actually a really a story at the end of the book, and I can't remember his name because I can only remember the kid's real name. We changed his name in the book, but it's toward the end of the book. Kid failing out of school, like literally school is about to kick him out and it's a, a magnet school for gifted kids. And so the mother and I talked and we agreed that the best thing to do would be to go to the head of the school and ask for a probationary semester for her kid um, so that he could give it one last shot before they kicked him out. But she also said to her kid, look, this is going to be all on you. I'm not going to rescue you. This has to be a turning point for you because you're in high school now. And uh, she also made him go to the school where he would have to attend if he did get kicked out of his school and it was not a great choice for him and so he went and he attended that school I think for a day or something and then came back and he's like okay I'm in that kid I have followed them that kid is now in college actually on a full scholarship to his first his college of choice and he points to that moment where his mother said no really I am not going to step in and rescue you you this is your screw up this is your picking up the pieces and you have to own your education he points to that moment as 
as the big turning point in his life. So while I'm not saying that's the answer for everyone, the ingredients are the answer, which is right now, a lot of kids are failing because it is difficult for them to feel engaged in school, because either because there's they're not attending classes with other kids, or there's a lot of distance between the ideas they're trying to learn and the relevance of those ideas. Why does why should I even care about this? We had a class, one of my kids was taking chemistry this last semester, and it was really hard for him because he couldn't see any practical application for this for him, for what he wants to do with his life. He's like, first of all, I can't visualize this stuff and it makes no sense to me and what am I going to do with it? So my job as a parent was not to teach him chemistry. My job as a parent was not to help him learn all of chemistry. It was to help him find ways to make that learning relevant for him because that's what's going to engage him. So we would go on YouTube and look at, you know, videos about how one uses chemistry in daily life, that kind of stuff. Um, We tried to make it as engaging as possible, hooking it in as much as possible to things he was interested in. The other thing we can do is find ways to, so for littler kids, another way you could do that is like, if your kids are just really having trouble with, and I've talked about this a couple of places, if your kids are having trouble, for example, with fractions, because they just make no sense. Like why would a little kid, it, it's right. difficult to understand, especially when you don't have a teacher right there with you all the time, showing you how that makes sense you know, go and make, bake something with your kid, but instead of using a whole cup measure, get rid of it, hide it and have a half cup, a third cup and a quarter cup and help the kid figure out how you can make those things that cup happen with those parts of a cup, making learning relevant, whether that's sewing or baking or learning about how you use chemistry in order to put two things together for something that interests your kid. Those are ways we make learning relevant. That's our job is to redirect our kids and try to make learning as relevant as possible for them. And the fun thing is now, so many museums are having trouble getting people in um, because we can't gather. So if you call up, um, for example, a children's museum or a science museum and you say, and you call up the education office or the communications office and you say, look, I have a kid who is just not understanding chemistry or not understanding fractions. Do you have lessons that you use with kids at your museum that maybe we could adapt for home? And I guarantee you those museums, children's museums, science museums, aquariums are going to say, oh my goodness, Goodness, yes, we pay a whole person just to come up with those things. Okay. Find the ways to make learn, hook learning into the things your kid is already interested in. If your kid is having trouble with math, but loves space, oh my gosh, the opportunities to make learning relevant in those arenas um, can be just amazing. But your job is not to be the kid's teacher. And one last thing, the other thing that you can really do is use this as an opportunity um, to help your kid communicate more clearly with their teachers. Because if when we're in this situation where a lot of the communication is happening virtually, there are a lot of opportunities, even for little, little kids to write a note or to have you uh, to dictate a note that you write to the teacher on their behalf and have them articulate what they're understanding, what they're not understanding, why they're frustrated. That not only inc- improves the teacher-student relationship, it improves the parent-home re- ch- parent-teacher relationship as well, but it gives the child a voice with the teacher. And, and just articulating what they don't understand is often exactly what they need to make them understand it. Mm-hmm. Um, being a, a good listener and a good sounding board is often what our kids need from us. So find relevance, encourage them to communicate, be the homeschool communications. You as parent do not need to be the homeschool communications. Let your kids take the reins on that and let the kids feel the consequences of that F. You know, when this chemistry thing happened, the reality was summer school or, you know, having to take the class over and derailing, you know, a good chunk of next year. And luckily we're we're in a pandemic right now and schools are being a little more flexible right now. So, you know, that's a really good bonus part of this. But some parents may say that if my child repeats a subject or grade, Mm -hmm. same school, it might be too embarrassing or for the child to handle. Um, And so, they want to make sure that they don't have that experience. What would you say to parents? 
Well, I, and I'm hoping that the teachers of these kids, um, you know, there are ways to assess learning and not just regurgitation and repetition. And, and there are tutors. I mean, what's the other thing that's been really interesting about so many college students being virtual is a lot of college students have had time to do some tutoring. And so what we decided was my son really needed some help with the chemistry um, in a way that I, as a parent, was not suited to help him with that. Mm -hmm. So what we did was we hooked him up with a college student, um, a local college student who had extra time because she was virtual and she was closer to his age. They were only a couple of years apart, but she right. had she was pre-med and had a lot of chemistry under her belt and loved the topic. And so they talked between themselves about what he didn't understand and what he did understand. And she helped him sort of catch up on some of the areas. Um, and I'm really hoping that as schools figure out ways to assess learning and not just regurgitation and not just, you know, people pleasing, which unfortunately is a big way that um, we tend to assess kids um, through things like uh, standards-based grading and mastery-based grading, which is um, uh, just such a boon for kids, we're going to be headed in a direction where parents can't just step in and say, well, I'm going to fix this then yeah. because you can't fix it without helping the kid learn the stuff like you can't learn the stuff for the kid and fix it so I'm sorry if summer school or repeating a grade doesn't uh, isn't part of your game plan but if your child is not learning then communicating clearly what the kid doesn't understand and finding flexible solutions and I have to say one of the flexible solutions recently with lots of schools has been allowing kids to take some classes pass fail um, if they need to or mm -hmm. allowing kids to retake parts of a class and not all of a class. I mean, these have been really flexible ways that responsive schools have been handling and, and feel free to, you know, suggest those things to schools. If you say, look, my kid was doing great until this last unit and then grandma got COVID and things got really dark in our house. So is there any way that our kid could get a tutor and relearn or re man re you know learn that information from that last unit retake the exam and see if he does better next time that might be a very realistic option for a school so get creative okay perfect um response for the parents who might be in the same situation uh, regarding failure of their children so the parents decide okay no more rescuing no more hovering and this is an older child, so mm -hmm. middle, middle childhood, teenage years. Yep. We're not going to give the responsibility back. But what if you realize that you have been so involved that the child <laughs> doesn't have the skills yep. to then structure themselves right. to study? Now yep. you've given back the responsibility. What do you do if you realize, I have been doing everything, but now my yep. child know how to study, they don't know how to set up a study timetable, they don't know how to be disciplined to do the things that I usually plan for them. Yep. Then what do I do? I can't sit back and have it crash and burn. Yeah, it's, it's really, and I have to say technology has been really helpful um, for things like this, like helping kids set up Google calendars with multiple alarms and things like that. As a teacher, I often recommend stuff like that. But in, in the book, The Gift of Failure, the middle school chapter is actually, yes, it's about middle school a little bit, but it's really about executive function. And executive function is this umbrella term over a whole bunch of different skills like time management, organization, planning, you know, planning long-term things, transitioning from one thing to another. So I break down each of those different skills under that umbrella right. and then explain ways that you can support that skill, because when people say, because what you're talking about in terms of all that management stuff, that's all executive function. And the reason nice. kids stink at it is because the last part of our brains to develop is our prefrontal cortex. Our frontal lobe is just not hooked up to the rest of the brain. And so while we're waiting for that to happen, what we do is we are their support, mm -hmm. not not the actual frontal lobe of the brain. We support them as they learn those things. So if you go to the middle school chapter and you figure out and keep in mind, kids might can, as they're learning those skills, they might be able to handle time management one week. And then all of a sudden they can't do time management anymore because they're suddenly getting good at, you know, long-term planning there. It's a constant evolution. And sometimes mm -hmm. things will regress and pick up and regress and pick up. So keeping in mind that 
it's not a linear slope. You know, it's not like every yes. single day is going to be slightly better. It's up and down like the stock market, right? right Look right. at those skills in that middle school chapter and in, inside each of those skills, inside every single one of those skills are scripts for how you can support your kid without doing for your kid. Because mm -hmm. that, think of yourself as, you know, when your kid is uh, riding a bike, is learning how to ride a bike and they have training wheels. Bikes with training wheels offer the ability often to lift the training wheels up little by little. You can loosen a nut and yes, lift yes. Those so that the training wheels get further and further and further off the ground because you don't want to go from training wheels all the way against the ground so that there's no chance they can fall over mm -hmm. to no training wheels at all, right? So right. you want to picture yourself like those training wheels, like if the bike's starts to tip over at a certain point, you know, you're, you will be there to support, but you're not going to keep the bike from tipping because keeping the bike tipping is what helps the kids develop their core strength so that they can pull back up and learn how to deal with the tipping. And so in the same vein, allowing a little metaphorical tipping to happen while your kids are just starting to learn those things. And, and also the one last thing is to mention to your kid, especially if it's an older kid, be really honest with them. Say, you know what, sweetie, I've been doing too much for you. And I really apologize because I think I've been underestimating your competence. I think I have been making it so that you are doing less than you're capable of doing. And kids really like to hear that we have faith in them, that they can be more competent. Mm -hmm. And it might be a little scary for them at first. So expect to see them get really nervous about going into a store and having to talk to someone for the first time or, you know, making those phone calls that they don't want to make or reaching out to a mentor. Those things are scary the first time they do them, yeah. but as they do them, given that you're there to sort of support them, the less scary they become over time. And, yeah. and so be those, be those training wheels, but allow them to tip.